Hello everyone, uh, welcome back for an exciting week on chapter 10. Uh, we're going to be talking about marketing research, which is an extremely broad topic. Um, so bear with me here as we go through the steps in the marketing research process. Um, there are five steps and we'll go through each one in just a moment, but I do want to quickly just comment before we go through each of these that um, your book kind of proposes this as a progression from step one to step two, to step three, all the way to step five. Um, but if you've ever done research, you probably know that it doesn't always or even usually really actually happen that way. Um, researchers do go back and forth from one step to another just as, as the need arises. So keep that in mind as we look at these. But if you want to try to logically organize these things in your brain, uh, step one would be to define the objectives and the research needs. Step two would be to design the actual research. Uh, step three, collect the data. Step four, analyze the data and develop some insights. And then step five, actually develop and implement an action plan um, for using that information you've collected. So we're going to look at each of these individually. As you're defining your objectives and your research needs, um, and, and in general, just to determine whether or not to conduct research, you should ask yourself two questions. What information is needed to answer a specific research question? And how should that information be obtained? So what and how are the two questions you're typically asking at the beginning of the research process to determine whether or not you need to conduct research? Uh, step two, if you decide, um, that yes, you would like to go ahead and move forward with your project, you need to actually design the research. Okay, and in this step, um, researchers usually identify the type of data that's needed and also determine the type of research that is necessary to collect that data. Um, you probably recall if you've read the chapter that the objectives of the project are actually what drive the type of data that you need and we're going to talk more about the types of research and the types of data here in just a moment but those objectives from step one do help um, kind of drive the type of data that you need um, so step three you're going to actually go ahead and start the data collection process and data can be collected from either secondary or primary sources and we're going to talk a little bit about the difference in those, but just to give you a general idea of the difference in these two, secondary data is usually collected prior to starting the research project, and it comes from both external and internal data sources, whereas primary data is usually collected to address some kind of specific research need that you have identified. Um, some really common examples of primary data collection would be focus groups, in-depth interviews, and surveys. We're going to talk more about all those things in just a little bit here. Um, so step four, now that you've collected your data, you need to go ahead and analyze and interpret that data and try to develop some insights. So this is a pretty thorough and very methodical process. And really to generate meaningful information, you have to analyze and make use of all that data. And just to be clear, in this case, data is just referring to some raw numbers, just some, some random numbers and factual information that may or may not by itself have any value whatsoever to you as a marketer. So that's why this interpretation process is so important because once you have organized and analyzed and interpreted the data into some type of form of useful information for decision making, that's considered to be information. So this step is really all about taking all of that data you've collected and trying to create it into um, some type of information that you can use to explain or predict or evaluate some kind of research situation. Okay, and finally, our last step in the marketing research process is to actually develop and implement an action plan based on everything that you put together. Um, so there's usually a typical way that this looks, usually... Um, as, you're, as you're pitching your idea or you're uh, putting the rubber to the road and actually making a plan, typically a marketing research report would start with a two-page executive summary. It's not always two pages, but um, usually an executive summary to start out. Um, this executive summary usually highlights um, the methodology and key insights of the research and the objectives of the study. 
And then you move into your body. The body of the report typically goes through the objectives of the study as well, the issues that are examined, um, other methodologies, analysis and results, um, and implications for managers. And then you conclude your report usually with any kind of limitations or caveats you may have found. And um, in today's world, this is most commonly seen with uh, something kind of like this, a PowerPoint that's been put together um, and some kind of questionnaire um, about your results and usually presented um, by some type of consultant or analyst, um, often with an executive summary to preface it via email. So um, this is kind of our marketing research process in a nutshell. But um, again, you're starting out just by identifying those research objectives and research needs designing your research, collecting some data, interpreting your data, and then creating an action plan. So kind of common sense in a way, but it is worth discussing. Uh, I do want to talk to you a little more about the types of secondary and primary data because that's something that you'll genuinely use in the real world if you do go into the marketing profession. So it's a little counterintuitive when we say primary and secondary data, but essentially secondary data is just talking about um, data that has been collected by someone other than the user. Um, and there's two types of secondary data that we look at. We have external and internal. As we look at external secondary data, there's a lot of different um, things you need to know here. So I'm just slowly going to kind of break these up. So typically, as you're looking for external secondary data in general, you usually find that it's free and really easy to find, such as like census information you might be looking for online. Um, Whereas something really specific like syndicated data as a form of external secondary data, syndicated data is usually a lot more detailed and usually a lot more helpful, to be honest, to your research. Um, but you do typically have to pay for it, and it's usually pretty expensive. You're usually purchasing it from someone like IRI or the National Purchase Diary Panel, um, something like that. Okay, uh, another area you need to know about is panel data and panel research in general is just information that's collected from some specific group of consumers that has been organized into a panel over time that's why we call it panel data or panel research um, and usually this panel data includes re records of um, what these customers the specific group of customers has purchased as well as their responses to some survey questions that the client may have written up front so Panel research is interesting because it kind of combines secondary and primary data, but I thought it was worth mentioning here. And then you have scanner data as well um, as your final form of external secondary data. And scanner data is usually used in quantitative research. And when you go to the grocery store and they scan that little barcode, that UPC label at the checkout counter, that's scanner data. They're just using that to collect information about um, maybe you as a consumer if you've scanned your loyalty card first or maybe they're just collecting information in general about how many people bought the blue box of Kraft mac and cheese and how much that price increase of 10 cents made for people buying that product or whatever so um, scanner data is used for that kind of thing we call it scanner data because obviously it comes from this barcode scanner at the grocery store or whatever store you're talking about so hopefully that helps give you a little picture of external secondary data as we look at internal secondary data, um, this is honestly one of my favorite things to talk about. And we as consumers are all the time providing all kinds of data to people in the world. Um, and firms as a whole have that data to use as a resource. So whenever we go and we purchase something online, they have a record of our purchase history. When we pick something up in the store and then set it back down, there are cameras watching to see why you did that and um, keeping track of all that information and we you know we provide our emails and our phone numbers and we get all kinds of information and we they can look and see how long we've stayed on a website or, or if, what website we came from before we went there and it's all very um, useful but firms have to actually decipher all of that data and typically all of this information is stored in a large database that we call a data warehouse so they They've been tracking all this information and they have all this information about us and our purchase history, but it's all just in this, this warehouse of information, just all these random facts. So as they go and try to convert it into information that can actually be used, um, they find a process called data mining. 
Okay, and data mining is just used to really extract that valuable information from the database and kind of call out what's important and what's not. And um, this is done often through forms of statistical analysis, um, where they're trying to look at different patterns in the data or different relationships among variables. Um, so for now, I just want you to know about the data warehouse and data mining in general as a sense of the term. Um, you may take a whole entire class in marketing research where you learn more about that, but for now, I just want you to be aware of where that information is stored and how that data is converted into information. Okay, um, so we've talked about secondary data. Let's talk a little bit about primary data. Remember, secondary data is collected by someone other than the person using it, whereas primary data is collected to address specific research needs, usually written by the person doing the research. Um, you can use either qualitative or quantitative research methods, and there are some examples here. Um, obviously, as the name implies, qualitative research is typically seen with very broad, open-ended questions, trying to understand the phenomenon of interest, um, and it's usually a little less formal than quantitative research methods. Uh, some examples of qualitative research are observation, in-depth interviews, social media, focus groups, so on and so forth, so forth, excuse me. <laughs> um, and once most organizations have, typically people do a little bit of both, a little bit of qualitative and a little bit of quantitative. Usually you do the qualitative stuff first, and then um, once you've done that, you usually engage in some quantitative research. And uh, these are usually just more structured responses that can be statistically tested. So think about quantitative and numbers. Usually you see things that are stats and, and numbers that you can actually use to, um, if you've taken a stats class, you know, confirm the null and reject the null and all that good stuff. Um, typically with quantitative research, you see things like um, surveys, panels, scanner data, experiments, or some combination of those things. Uh, very quickly, um, I think we all know what a survey is, so I, I did not choose to define that for you here. But I, I do just want to comment from a real-world perspective that it's impossible to survey every single person um, in your particular group of interest. So oftentimes, marketers will pick a sample, and just like in stats class when you were talking about samples, um, a sample in this case is just a group of consumers who represent customers of interest. And we're going to look at some different examples here in just a moment of samples. I have a couple videos for you, but just know it's impossible to survey everyone, so we typically take a sample of group of consumers in our interest. So if we want to know about uh, female college students, um, we can't get every single female college student on the face of the planet and ask them a question. So we might get a group of 100 or 200 or 300 and survey all of them and then try to predict something generally about that population. So as we look at some different types of um, primary data here, we have observation. Um, observation is exactly what it sounds like. You are observing someone do something. Typically you're examining purchases and their consumer behavior, their consumption behavior, um, maybe in person or via video cameras or Maybe you're just tracking their movements electronically as they move through a store. Uh, we'll talk about an Amazon Go store and how that actually happens. And without any people in it, they can sit and observe everything that you do. So kind of interesting. It could even be as simple as online, putting something in your cart and taking it out or putting it on your wish list or whatever. Um, all that's observation. Okay. Social media is a huge, 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 huge source of data for marketers and uh, the really cool thing about social media is that typically people who contribute their opinions to these sites, they're usually not too shy about what they want to say. Uh, they're usually very out, you know, upfront. Either they're singing praises or they are angry and this was the worst service ever. So usually they're pretty um, honest and um, good sources of information for marketers to kind of monitor and gather and take all this data to learn about things that customers like, things that they dislike, and just their preferences in general. And there's a process we use to do that called sentiment mining. Uh, this is just where essentially we collect consumers' comments about the company or about products or services on social media sites, 
and we take this data and we analyze it to kind of distill the customer's overall attitude towards um, certain preferences for products and advertising campaigns in general. And usually most companies have hired by now a certain social media person um, whose job is just to scour all the different social media sites for this reason. Um, but sentiment mining is useful because um, it's really difficult for a human to actually be on all those sites at once and be able to monitor all of that. I mean, there's just a lot out there on social media platforms. So we've combined a lot of automated search tools with different text analysis techniques um, in order to kind of gather some qualitative data um, using technology to help us form some insights about what consumers really think. So. Um, sentiment mining is usually accompanied with some form of technology that will help these um, social media marketers scour the internet to get information they need to make generalizations about their customers and their likes and their dislikes and their preferences and then in turn relay that to the company and make sure that the products are meeting all of those needs. So that's sentiment mining. Um, as we talk about in-depth interviews, this is a really interesting topic and I'm going to kind of digress just a smidge about mall intercept surveys as we talk about in-depth interviews, but mall intercepts are super important for you to know, and they're something that are only very, very briefly discussed in your textbook. So I felt like it was worth supplementing that just a little bit with something a little more important that you need to know. So first, let's start with in-depth interviews. So in an in-depth interview, some kind of trained researcher usually starts asking questions and listening to and recording the answers of um, an individual, and then they usually pose additional questions to try to clarify or expand on that issue as the interview continues. Um, so you might, um, rather than simply observing a teenager shop at a mall and seeing what they like, uh, you might actually stop them and ask a question. Um, and this is a form of in-depth interviewing known as the mall intercept survey. Okay, uh, think about, I know nothing about sports, okay, but think about whenever uh, a ball gets intercepted. Um, in the same way, you're intercepting a teenager or whatever, whoever your focus group is in this case, you're, um, you're intercepting that individual at a mall, so it's called a mall intercept survey. And you might ask them some direct questions. So rather than just watching their behavior, like we did with observation, uh, these mall intercept surveys are really helpful because you can ask them questions like, hey, I saw that you walked into Abercrombie and Fitch, but you came out in like less than a minute. Why was that? And, you know, they might tell you, oh, well, uh, you know, nobody waited on me. And you might say, oh, gosh, uh, did you want more assistance than that? And they'll say, yeah. And, They'll say, okay, well, what was your expectation? How quickly should they have greeted you? And, you know, you can take that and kind of relay that to your company. So something else that's really useful for mall intercept surveys, it doesn't always have to be um, you asking questions necessarily as much as it is just imparting knowledge. So um, you may have gone to a mall where you've noticed people that stop you and ask questions and say, hey, hey, can I can I show you this? Or, oh, look at this, this new massage we have, or look at this product we're selling, or, oh, please come here to my booth and look at this. Okay, those people are um, engaging in what we call the mall intercept. So, and sometimes they're just trying to showcase their product and their product features and the operations of their product, uh, you know, give a demonstration of that product. And that's their only goal. Other times they might have more questions and stop you and say, hey, you know, would you fill out this survey? Or, hey, can I ask you this really quick question and I'll walk with you? And uh, they just use that information to, um, you know, inform the company. So I have a little video for you here of kind of a funny example of a mall intercept survey. I think it's only like 30 seconds long, but I think it'll be useful to you. So take a moment and watch this video. Excuse me, ma'am. Can I have a moment of your time? True or false? I enjoy frosting in the morning. True. Raise the roof. Try to remain professional, sweets. True or false, sir? A nutritionally sound cereal is important to me. True. Bravo. Add a notch to the wheats, Tally. Whatever. Okay. That's 43 likes for the sweet side and 43 likes for the wheat side. So what have we learned? I've learned time at the mall is better spent buying shirts. Shirts? You don't wear clothes and you have no arms. Speak for yourself. 
Okay, so you got to see an example of um, these frosted mini wheats and how they were engaging in a mall intercept survey with passersby in a mall. Okay, one of the most important things from this week that I want to talk to you about are focus group interviews. And uh, when I say a focus group interview, I'm talking about a really small group of people, usually anywhere from 8 to 12. It can be more, it can be less, but uh, usually they all come together for some kind of intense discussion about a particular topic. And I do have an example I'm going to show you in a second. Um, but usually using some kind of really unstructured, really loose method of inquiry, some kind of moderator guides the conversation asking some predetermined um, generally agreed upon topics of interest and outlines all of these things. Um, typically the researcher will record all of this so that they can go back later and try to observe any patterns of you know nonverbal cues, body language, um, verbal cues, things like that. And just in general, these focus groups gather qualitative data about people's reactions to new or existing products, uh, try to get their opinions about competitors' offerings and what's, you know, what do we do that's as good as our competitor? What do we do that could be uh, improved, would be better than our competitor? Um, or maybe they just want to gauge um, a consumer's reaction to some type of marketing stimuli, like maybe an ad campaign or a point of purchase display. Whatever it might be, these focus groups are very, very helpful in the marketing world. The only disadvantage to these is that usually your sample size is not large enough to be quantitatively measured. So go back to what we talked about earlier about, uh, let's say we're trying to make a generalization about female college students and um, you know we take a sample of them. Well, for a survey, we might sample two or three hundred and that sample size is probably large enough to make um, you know a good assumption about those people and use that as a guiding factor. Whereas with these focus groups, uh, we might get more um, qualitative information. We got, might get more honest and great feedback and, oh, things we didn't think about, and it, it's great for trying things. But from 8 to 12 people, th that sample size is just not large enough to actually quantitatively measure um, any particular important thing that you could generalize um, for your product. So um, that's the only disadvantage to these, but you do get some good information from them. I want to show you an example briefly of a focus group and kind of what it's all about with a very short YouTube clip here. So take a moment and enjoy this video. Well, digital marketing is actually pretty simple. You should take online courses on Udemy. Sorry, add. The process may also be observed by researchers through a one-way mirror. But although they can provide valuable insight, focus groups do have their limitations. And one of the main ones is that the simple act of observing something can change it. This principle is called observer interference. The answers participants give are likely to be affected by the presence of the researchers, social pressure from the rest of the group, or simply knowing that they're taking part in a focus group. And because researchers often use a small sample size in a specific setting, it's hard to generalize their results. The findings that researchers do reach from focus groups are often tested through experiments and data gathering. Those put numbers on questions like how many potential customers there are and what price they'd be willing to pay. This part of the process changes as technology evolves. But focus groups have remained largely the same for decades. Perhaps when it comes to the big important questions, there's no substitute for people genuinely interacting with each other. Okay, so you can kind of see the pros and the cons of focus groups there. Um, folks, that is all that I have for you this week. I hope that you have enjoyed um, our short little discussion here on marketing research. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you.